My name is Ren Berry, and I'm giving a talk on Jainism. Uh, I'm sure some of you have a modicum of information about the Jains. Uh, they, uh, until the, the middle of the 19th century, they were uh, unheard of in the West. They were discovered uh, by uh, German scholars, and English, uh, the English were occupying uh, India at the time. And they came. Uh, they came to light uh, uh, to the Eng English uh, archaeologists who were working there. Uh, but uh, they remained a, an obscure sect uh, until until uh, Albert Schweitzer wrote his study of Indian philosophy in, in the uh, in the 1920s. Uh, and then they uh, have become more and more into prominence as the West has become interested in such matters as uh, vegetarianism and animal rights. Uh, they have taken uh, more of an interest in uh, Jain, Jain religion. And uh, in spite of the fact that they are the, probably one of the smallest religious sects in the world, they constitute 1% of the Indian population, which is about, they have about uh, six to nine nine million members. Not all of them are Orthodox Jains. Um, so they constitute one of the smallest religious sects in the world, and yet they exert a, an influence that has been disproportionate to their numbers. And it's an influence that is, is burgeoning in the West. Um, it's important to, uh, that we in the West uh, learn as much as we can about Jain Jain principles, because uh, for, for one thing, they, they've uh, shaped the philosophy of one of the 20th century's most uh, seminal uh, figures, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi grew up in uh, north, northwestern India, in a region of northwestern India called Gujarat. Uh, <clears throat> he was born into a family of Hindus, uh, a merchant family that tended to intermarry with Jains in that region. The, uh, the Hindus and Jains uh, intermarry. And one of the most, uh, his mentor actually when he was growing up, the man who uh, shaped his political philosophy uh, was a Jain philosopher named Raj Chandra. And uh, he uh, sort of inculcated Gandhi with the, with the ideas of uh, Nonviolent resistance, uh, with uh, ahimsa, making uh, ahimsa uh, the foremost uh, principle in his life, and rededicating himself to uh, to vegetarian uh, principles. So Gandhi uh, Gandhi has grown up uh, had grown up steeped in uh, Jainism, uh, and his influence has obviously been. Uh, Worldwide, uh, Gandhi is, was instrumental in throwing off the yoke of uh, British imperialism, and uh, he was one of the first figures uh, to do so. To, uh, so the anti-colonial movement throughout the world, the uh, the, the t techniques of nonviolent resistance uh, were brought into into play by by Gandhi, who was uh, who was a Jain in, in all respects except. Uh, the formal religious ones. Um, Gandhi is, is also responsible for popularizing the word ahimsa, the Sanskrit word, uh, and it's become associated with him and his movement. Um, we uh, today ahimsa is uh, is, a, is a commonly uh, used in the West. Uh, it's almost become a a, t uh, a term that a universal term that everyone understands, which is quite remarkable. Uh, it was first translated into English by, I mean, uh, by Albert Schweitzer in the 1920s in his uh, book on Indian philosophy. He translated the the word ahimsa uh, as into the phrase, a rather deathless phrase, reverence for life, reverence for life. That was his. 
his equivalent of the term ahimsa. And that has become a phrase that has been adopted by many uh, uh, vegetarian and animal groups in the, in the West. Uh, until the middle of the uh, 20th century, uh, it was believed by, by most scholars that Mahavira was, was the founder of the Jains, the Jain religion. Uh, I'll just spell his name. If you're, if you're not familiar with it, uh, uh, he, w he was born in uh, approximately 5, 540 B.C. Uh, in uh, a region of uh, north, northeastern India, in the kingdom of Vaishali. He was a contemporary of, uh, of another great religious teacher, uh, uh, Siddhartha Gautama, who, uh, who was born in, uh, in, a, uh, in a town, a kingdom also, a, he was a, a son of a king, uh, in a city that was not far from Nepal. They were both, uh, it's quite remarkable that the two of the greatest world teachers uh, have, were born in the same, same region at the same time and spoke the same language, Magadhi, which is a, was a dialect, uh, uh, a di the dialect spoken by both Mahavira and the Buddha. It's often said that, it's been speculated that Buddha himself was, was actually a Jain because uh, when he uh, when he renounced his his throne and his uh, prince princely uh, prerogatives at the age of thirty, he uh, he took took up the life of, of a Jain. It corresponds to it corresponded to the life of a Jain sadhu. Uh, he uh, wore a veil and uh, he he carried a pincha, which is a uh, a device for for it's like a little broom, a whisk broom that the Jains, many Jains used to, to sweep the path of insects. Uh, so this occurred in the 6th century, uh, sixth century BC. At the same time, other teachers uh, had arisen throughout the world who were teaching the same, yes? question on the date again, 540 BC is for what? Uh, that's the date, that it's, not, it's not really, uh, uh, the date of his birth has not actually been uh, uh, ascertained. So it's, it's roughly, this is Mahavira's birthday. Do you mind me asking what source are you using for that? Uh, I use the Cambridge uh, Ancient History. Okay, so I, it, uh, it varies. The very common date is 590 BC, for instance. Yeah. And um, so it's a lot of Western scholars use that date as well. I know, it's, but it's, a, it's a, very, a date that is difficult to, uh, yes, that's to determine. So some people feel that he was uh, older than, than the Buddha, some people feel that he was younger, younger or contemporary. But it was roughly at this time. Uh, it's also very hard to, to determine a date for Lao Tzu in China, who was a contemporary of uh, yeah, and they were teaching very, very much the same uh, doctrine of ahimsa, nonviolence, and uh, Pythagoras in the West. Uh, Pythagoras, I'm sure you all, all have heard of him. Uh, he was also about 580 B.C. Uh, Lao Tzu in China was also about uh, 560 BC. Um, Zoroaster. Uh, so these are uh, some of the great uh, Buddha Buddha. Uh, Five sixty, we'll say. BC. They're not absolutely certain about these dates, but they, they, they're fair, they've uh, conjectured that they all they, they occurred in the same uh, century, and rough, roughly contemporary. And uh, they all arose at about the same time, and they were preaching very much the same message. Uh, and it's quite remarkable that, that there is this coincidence of great world teachers. Uh, one might wonder what, what accounted for this uh, simultaneous appearance of all these, these uh, great teachers. And uh, uh, so many people have theorized that it was the, the Aryan invasions, the Indo-European invasions from, uh, from the steppes of southern Russia. Uh, they were called the Aryans. 
Prior, prior to World War II, they were called the Aryans, uh, but because of Hitler's uh, racial uh, theories, uh, this term was, uh, was abandoned. Uh, now it only refers to the conquerors of India. Uh, the, the term, the term of, uh, that is in current usage is Indo-European. Uh, and these were these uh, these terms refer to uh, tribes of nomadic peoples who uh, uh, who uh, swept down from the uh, from the steppes of southern Russia, and uh, they were a very uh, mobile nomadic people, warlike. They worshipped male gods, a male pantheon of gods. They uh, uh, sacrificed animals, and they they uh, were. Uh, enormous uh, milk, milk drinkers, uh, and they invaded India, Persia, Greece, uh, Italy, and uh, parts of Europe. Uh, it's interesting that they, all of these, the languages that are spoken in these uh, regions are all uh, cognate. And, uh, in other words, ancient Greek and uh, Sanskrit are cognate languages, and many of the, the terms and many of the words are, are similar also in uh, ancient Persian. And they, uh, they trace this back to the, to the original tribe of Aryans who spread, who spread the doctrine of, uh, of mediating animal sacrifice and worship of, of male gods. These are the attributes of the Aryans. Uh, in India, when they invaded India, they uh, clashed with the uh, indigenous people, uh, and they are it is thought that the Aryans introduced the, the caste system and many of the uglier aspects of uh, Indian social life, uh, such as uh, uh, the practice of sati, where widows would, would uh, fling themselves on the py uh, funeral pyre of their husband, uh, the, uh, the immobility, social immobility uh, of the caste system, uh, the uh, the patri rigid patriarchy of Indian society, and of course the, the male gods. Uh, not to mention the uh, institution of animal sacrifice, and which gave rise to, to flesh eating. I believe it gave rise to flesh eating. And the Buddha and Mahavira uh, were uh, members of this uh, indigenous religion, uh, Jainism. Uh, which uh, actually rose up to protest the excesses of the, of the Brahmin priests, who were the descendants of the Aryan fire priests, who were practicing animal sacrifice on a, uh, on a uh, grandiose scale. And so they, they, uh, they were prompted to, uh, to reform the Aryan, uh, uh, the Aryan institutions, which were demanded with the, the Aryan priests were, were stealing animals from the uh, from the middle class and from the farmers, and uh, using them in their sacrifices, they were they were taxing the people to pay for these sacrifices. So uh, uh, Jainism and Buddhism can be can be viewed as a reform movement uh, uh, to uh, whose intent was to reform the the practices of the the uh, Aryans, the Aryan invaders, uh, whose religion. Uh, is still somewhat in, pro in place, and in it's preserved in Hinduism. Uh, the Jains believe that they have the, the Jainism is the oldest uh, religion in India, and if not the world. They, they claim that, uh, in Jain that Jainism has no beginning point and no end, end point. Uh, it's, in other words, it's eternal. Uh, Mahavira, uh, is is called the uh, the twenty fourth uh, Tirthankara. Uh, Tirthankara uh, Mahavira is the twenty fourth Tirthankara. Tirthankara is uh, translated loosely as Ford Maker. Uh, uh, these were uh, great religious teachers in, in Jain history who uh, influenced. Uh, the people and uh, connected uh, the people with uh, the, the, their, 
the higher teachings of Jainism. Uh, Uh, the Jains were also the first vegetarian religious group to uh, articulate their concern for, for animals. Uh, one of the most ancient uh, institutions in, in Jainism is, is called the Pinjarpal. Pinjarpal. Uh, Pinjarpal is uh, an animal hospital, or a rest home for animals, and these, this is a very venerable institution in Jainism. It, it, it even predates Mahavira. And uh, uh, in the uh, Jain communities in, in Gujarat, where most of the Jains are concentrated today, uh, one can find pinjara poles in almost any community. These are animal hospitals which uh, are, uh, are set up to, to uh, take care of animals that have been rescued from the streets and from slaughterhouses animals that are disabled and are in extremis. Uh, they have rooms, uh, in some of the larger printer poles, they have rooms that are set aside for, for birds and insects, even insects. Uh, they even have te techniques for maintaining and sustaining uh, insect life. It's quite, quite extraordinary. Uh, for this reason, the Jains, uh, many of the Jains have been uh, have been accused of being insect lovers, insect worshippers, uh, which I think is uh, it tends to, to belittle what they stand for. Uh, they do uh, hold insects and, and they revere insect life, uh, just as they do all forms of life. Um, but they they have some very fussy taboos uh, about uh, avoiding the uh, avoiding killing or harming of insects. They go out of their way. They, as I said, they carry these brooms, uh, many of them, uh, the pinchas, uh, to clear the path. And uh, the, the munis, uh, the Jain monks, are very careful to avoid uh, injuring insects. Uh, when they sit down, uh, when they, uh, when they uh, uh, prepare their garments uh, for, for wearing and put them away, they're always careful to to go through them and make, to make sure that there are no insects uh, clinging to them. Uh, so they take particular care with everything they do. Uh, they will not eat, uh, for example, they will not eat food that uh, contains uh, an excess of bacteria. Uh, the food food has to be prepared for the Jain the Jain monks. Now we're talking about the monks right now. These are uh, called uh, munis. Uh, muni or sa sadhu, and the female, the feminine is sadhvi. The uh, there are female monks as, as well as male monks, and theoretically, they uh, they are on an equal footing. And uh, it's customary for the uh, for the Jain monks to uh, to have their food prepared for them by by members of the, of the Jain community. Uh, they do not uh, cook their own food. They, uh, they go out every day to a chosen member of, of the community. To fa the families actually uh, clamor to have, to be able for the, for the honor of being able to uh, prepare and serve food to the, to the Jain monks. Uh, uh, usually one in a, uh, in a group of, of, of monks will will go to a household and bestow the honor upon them of, of accepting their, their, uh, their food. Uh, they take, usually take these little, three, they usually have three little bowls that they carry with them, highly, highly lacquered bowls, uh, which they polish themselves. And they, they, uh, the, they receive the food in these, in these alms bowls. And uh, they the, the, the food is actually very, uh, very meager. The food that they will accept, of course, the families try to, uh, to uh, give them as much, you know, generous portions. But the uh, the munis uh, invariably refuse, and they will go back with these meager servings and then share them out among several other monks, usually four other monks. Uh, they only take enough food to sustain life. Uh, one will, one will have to search. Uh, one, uh, 
very, very hard and long to find an overweight Muni. Uh, they just don't exist in, uh, in Jainism. Um, the first uh, Western encounter uh, with the Jains actually occurred uh, quite some time ago. And it's, it's extraordinary that they should have been forgotten uh, because uh, the first meeting uh, between East and West uh, between the, occurred in uh, the year 326 BC uh, when Alexander the Great uh, and his army uh, of uh, phalanxes uh, uh, penetrated India <coughs> Uh, on his way through, uh, he cut a, a wide swath through north, northwestern India, and on his way, uh, way south, he encountered a, a group of, uh, of naked men and women uh, who were uh, engrossed in conversation. Uh, and he was quite, his curiosity was piqued uh, by the spectacle of these, uh, these naked men and women. And uh, he asked he, his interpreter, he, he took his interpreter, and and strode up to him, up to them, um, and tried to engage them in conversation. But they, they would not uh, be drawn into conversation because, uh, uh, they, as they told the interpreter, he was wearing his armor. And they were, they were pacifists, being Jains, and they would, not, uh, they would not speak to a man in battle dress. So Alexander the Great had to remove his, his armor before they would talk to him. And it's, it's, it's uh, speculated that his conversation with the Jains uh, so, uh, so baffled him and nonplussed him that he was, uh, he retreated. But he did retreat, uh, actually, not, not long after that. So uh, some people have uh, concluded that it may have been this conversation. Because after all, here was, here was the, the greatest uh, con world conqueror that has ever existed, meeting a group of uh, these naked philosophers who, uh, whose object in life was to renounce the world. And they stood for everything that uh, they, they, they uh, represented the antithesis of what uh, Alexander uh, was striving for. So, yes? I have a question about the, um, uh, I've never read the, the part where actually the female monks have been naked also. Uh, that's what we come across? Yes, at this time, uh, the, uh, I believe the, 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 the monks, the male and female monks, uh, were uh, went unclothed. Uh, Is that right? so yeah. You say that later on, and the females you know, chose to, to wear the clothing. You know, the clothing of the gumbers also, but it's, always, gumbers, it's yeah. always believed that the uh, male monks are the ones who will go nude. The females never will do that. Uh, well, reason, we can't explain why, but, uh, yeah. according to well, the sources that I've uh, mm -hmm. I've read, the the uh, there, was, there was a split that occurred. Uh, after. Yeah, yeah, but I'm talking about these monks though. I've never heard of any time where the female, the nuns would say sadhis. Not, not currently, not currently, but uh, pre, uh, in, this, in this period, supposedly the, the males and the female monks uh, were what they called the gambras, or sky, they call them sky clad. Mahavira, Mahavira himself was uh, sky clad. Uh, this is a sort of poetic term. It seems poetic to us, actually. Uh, that they should refer to uh, going nude as, as being sky-clad. Uh, they had no prurient uh, connotation. Uh, nude nakedness was, was considered natural. It wasn't considered today. It would be considered a wildly eccentric for a priest to go about unclothed. Uh, but in India today, uh, in, south, in the south, the, uh, one can still find uh, in Bombay, for example, there are Degambra temples where the Munis uh, Hold forth in, in the new. There, there is no inhibition about it. In fact, they pose uh, unashamedly for photographs in the new. So uh, it was believed that at this time they were all, all the Jains were, the Munis anyway, were de and uh, including the female. Uh, Alexander's term for them was uh, gymnosophists. Uh, in Greek, uh, gymnos means uh, naked, and sophist uh, is, uh, uh, gives us our word for philosopher. The word philosopher and sophist are the same, sophos, wisdom, the same, same root. So these were the naked philosophers, that was his term for them. And this has remained in, uh, 
in usage, actually. It's in, it became, it entered the, it entered Attic Greek at this time. And, uh, so, uh, that was the first Western encounter with, uh, with the Jain. Uh, then they receded into, uh, into uh, oblivion, at least for the West, and, but they continued to influence uh, events in India, naturally. Uh, and they, uh, they, as I said, they have a, uh, an influence that is out of all proportion to their, uh, their numbers. Uh, the, uh, the Jains have, as I said, probably the fussiest uh, taboos, and uh, they, uh, they consider the world to be charged with, with uh, vitality. Uh, they have a, uh, a scale of, uh, of values, of, uh, values that they, uh, they assign to each uh, life form, actually. Uh, even the most, uh, the most, uh, uh, the smallest form of life, uh, life forms that we would consider inanimate, uh, the most footling uh, forms of life, such as a stone or a flame, are assigned a life value by the James. They assign one sense, for example, to, to, a, to a stone or a rock. Uh, flames and water, water droplets, are assigned one sense. So in other words, if you are uh, unthinking in your treatment of a stone or a, a plant, or you're, cons you're, con you're uh, considered to be committing an act of violence. Uh, yes? Well, what would you say would that have a soul of? Uh, they, according to uh, the uh, classical Jain doctrine, uh, every, every form of life has, has a, a sense of some, of some kind. Uh, what do you say? Um, from what I understand, it's, it's always more like there are Earth body beings or fire fire body beings, right, right? But there is such a thing as something that that which does not have a soul, and there are things that which have souls. Mm -hmm. And what might happen is, in a in a stone, you might find some kind of a life form that's trapped within right, the right. stone, mm -hmm. and therefore there would be a soul there. But there is definitely living and non-living, where that which has a soul, and that which does not have a soul. So but when you say that, yeah, they assign one sense. I think it's because it's possible that there may be some form of very, very microscopic living being that's within that. Yes. Yeah. So, so there definitely is a distinction between living yeah, and Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly there's a distinction between one sense beings and five sense beings. Now, five sense beings are all animals are considered to be uh, uh, bipeds and quadrupeds and fish and birds are considered to be five sense beings. They have five senses. Uh, <clears throat> insects, for example. The higher insects, they also make a distinction between higher and lower insects. Uh, there are insects that have four senses and three senses. Uh, the four sense insects would include uh, uh, grasshoppers, uh, bees, flies. Uh, they have uh, the senses of smell, taste, touch, and hearing. These are the four senses. The other and the lower insects uh, are thought to lack the sense of sight. Uh, they include moths, ants, mosquitoes, <clears throat> and bed bugs. These, uh, these are three sensed insects. Uh, there's the, the, the old canard about the Jane uh, who, uh, who refused to, uh, his bed was full of bugs, and he refused to kill the, the bugs because they uh, were considered to be <clears throat> an act of cruelty. So he just <clears throat> allowed them to, <clears throat> to bite him uh, at will. Uh, there is some, there is a, a grain of truth in this because Mahavira, the legend of Mahavira, when he was in meditation, would allow the bugs and, uh, to feed on him and uh, the scorpions to sting him. And uh, he was oblivious of any uh, of these insect bites, and he would not, uh, <coughs> certainly would not uh, move to kill them or to, to even to flick them away, uh, cause them any discomfort. Uh, you will not find a, a fly swatter in most Jane households, for example. Uh, and uh, so they, it's still, in Orthodox Jane's households, uh, they're still, they, they keep these, uh, at least they honor these taboos. Uh, what about you uh, also? Uh, uh, yeah, we don't know, we try not to, but uh, we try to find ways where you can just catch them and let them outside or whatever. Yeah. Be creative, I guess. <laughs> 
So, I mean, many Westerners, of course, are uh, aghast at, this, at these practices. And, but uh, I think that it has served to uh, preserve uh, the, uh, the purity of Jainism. Uh, they consider themselves uh, not without uh, justice to be the, uh, the spiritual conscience of, of India. And the Jains uh, also consider themselves to be the, the oldest religion in India, as I said. Uh, they consider Hinduism actually to be a, an offshoot of Jainism, uh, a sort of Jain heresy. Uh, and uh, if you, uh, also Buddhism is also considered to be an offshoot of Jainism. Uh, and I think there's a great deal of merit for that. Uh, as I said, Buddha adopted many of the practices of the Munis uh, when he uh, renounced the world. Uh, the whole idea of renouncing the world, of going naked, wearing a veil, carrying a pincha, as Buddha did, were Jain, uh, Jain characteristics. Uh, so they actually have these, these very complicated uh, this, uh, hierarchy of, of life, of values. Uh, and I think uh, it's, it tends to uh, corroborate their their claim that theirs is the oldest religion, because they have in India certainly the oldest that espouses uh, ahimsa and vegetarianism and nonviolence, uh, because they, they have the most complicated uh, uh, set of values, and uh, they are the least apt to, to backslide. Many Hindus have lapsed from Hinduism and become meat eaters. Uh, whereas very, uh, the proportion of Jains who have done that is, is almost negligible. Uh, it's true that in, in, modern, in modern cities, uh, such as Bombay, the, the sec second or third generation uh, who have grown up there will relax their values somewhat. For example, the Jains, uh, the Orthodox Jains will not eat root vegetables uh, because uh, it's believed that uh, the uprooting of plants from the soil will, dis will disturb the insect life, uh, subterranean microbes and insect life that cling to the root system. So uh, the older, the uh, previous generation of Jains would, would not uh, eat uh, root vegetables, but the younger generation is relaxing its, uh, its uh, standards somewhat, and, the, and they're eating potatoes and carrots uh, without guilt. Uh, out of your family? Oh, yeah, we take a note, for instance, we know, you know, eat fruit vegetables, but um, I guess one interesting thing, if I can add, I hate to keep interrupting you here, um, but, but for instance, you, know, you said thing about the uh, microorganisms or whatever, the plant, the, the, the other way to look at it also is that, you know, they're, they're looking for this principle of least harm, and you can always pluck an apple off of a tree and not kill the tree, for instance, whereas if you remove this potato from the ground, you're removing a good part of the plant, you're almost effectively killing the plant, and that's, the, the crucial part of the, the thinking why they choose sometimes not to eat the root vegetables. Um, as you said, the practice is such that you know, maybe a lot of the younger generation probably does yeah. you know, have fries and things like that all the time. But uh, I think more strict ones, well, very few will really find that don't consume the younger generation. Yeah, uh, but it is extra extraordinary how many of the younger generation, uh, let's say 20 men in their 20s, uh, who, who run shops, shopkeepers, very uh, pragmatic uh, men. Uh, and women who uh, who still uh, adhere to the old values, and they will not eat root vegetables. They uh, are very strict uh, in their uh, food. Everything has to be filtered. The water has to be filtered. Yes. I'm um, just curious. I mean, I kind of assume this is the case. It's, you know, they won't eat root vegetables. But the Orthodox Jains also just eat dairy products. Uh, well, the, uh, the the Jain, the the Munis, many of the Munis will not eat, uh, will not take dairy products. So. I, most of the, the great preponderance of Jains in India are, uh, do take dairy products, but you have to remember that the dairy industry is not the agribusiness that it is in this country. It's not as, uh, as cruel and uh, uh, ruthless as the, as the agribusiness here. The animals are not mistreated, uh, by and large, in India. And uh, they don't consume you know, rivers of milk as we do in this country. They, they might take a, a dollop of yogurt with their meal, just a little bit here and there. I mean, they don't. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, I'm just curious about like, insect products. Do you know, you uh, some, uh, yeah, some of the uh, sadhus avoid honey, and uh, many of the chain. Uh, explicitly stated. Uh, 
that there's something to avoid. Um, dairy products, for instance, well, my experience has been that a lot of the um, sadhus, in this country at least, do consume dairy products. Mm -hmm. I've yet to find more than one or two that, that have But in India, I think it's a little bit different. Yeah, they're much stricter in, the, in India. In the temples, the sadhus are a very, uh, well, try to avoid milk because, after all, milk uh, easily spoils and the tainted milk attracts uh, microbes and uh, organisms and they uh, studiously avoid uh, eating uh, food that has been uh, spoiled or that might contain microorganisms. Uh, that's why, for example, Jains will not eat, uh, uh, Orthodox Jains must eat their food in the within 24 hours of preparation because if uh, they will not eat leftovers. A uh, Jain monk will never, will never touch leftovers. It has to be cooked uh, immediately, because uh, leftovers obviously attract uh, bacteria. Bacteria uh, is they wouldn't eat like sour? That's right. They will not eat fermented foods. Uh, that's why many of them, uh, the strict Jains in, in, uh, and the, uh, the Moonies are vegan, because they will not uh, touch uh, anything that, uh, milk for example, milk products because of the bacteria, high bacteria content. And obviously for that reason they will not consume uh, alcoholic beverages because uh, alcoholic beverages are fermented, <coughs> fermented grain, fermented fruit, <coughs> which contain the, the bodies of uh, dead yeast fermentation. Dead, dead yeast, yeah. So they will not, even though bacteria was, was not really discovered, the principle of the germ, you know, the germ theory, uh, it was not discovered until the uh, late 19th century. The Jains have always have been very prescient in this regard, and they have, have surmised that, 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 the, that uh, food does contain bacteria, but, and that they have other terms for them. They call them the gotha, and other, they have their own words for them. But they have been remarkably proved to be remarkably prescient in their uh, in their theories. Uh, they also believe in uh, flame spirits and uh, water bodies and. Things about these have not been scientifically established yet, but perhaps someday uh, they will be. I guess today it's regarded as, as a punitive uh, karma. If you if you have a bad karma, you may be reincarnated as a uh, a flame spirit and live for an instant, or you might be imprisoned in a stone. Uh, uh, so uh, some people might actually enjoy that. But, uh, yes. Given how old this culture is and the traditions, has it ever been studied in terms of health? Do they live longer than their peers? Do they thrive physically? Yes, uh, especially the Moonies uh, uh, are very long-lived. Uh, the uh, <coughs> Moonies are, are uh, like Mahavira, for example. They uh, preserve the, the spirit of Mahavira. Mahavira what was uh, Digambara. Of course, the, the majority of Moonies are uh, what they call Spitambara. Uh, this means that they wear white white claws. They're, not, they're virtually naked. I mean, if you see, they wear these two little strips of, of uh, white, white cotton uh, just as a covering for their body. It's, it's very flimsy. Uh, but they, uh, they're very long lived. They, they, they're not permitted to ride in vehicles. They walk uh, tremendous distances uh, barefooted. They're not permitted to wear shoes. Uh, I mean, for obvious reasons, because of the leather. Uh, they probably wouldn't wear them anyway. In fact, they're, they're, the bottoms of their feet are tougher than, <coughs> than most of them, shoe leather. Shoe leather. Uh, the, 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 the female, the sadwis and the sadus, they walk uh, hundreds of kilometers uh, a day, very often. Uh, and you find eight, you know, eight, uh, the sadus in their 80s, men and women, walking these enormous distances uh, uh, in bare feet. Uh, they walk in groups. and. Uh, a, uh, quite a striking uh, sight if, if you see a group of them go by. And this, of course, is very inspiring for, for, the, uh, for the people you know, in the community when they see this group of uh, sadhus, men and women, walking along uh, in their bare feet. And they wonder who they are and what they stand for. And then they find out that they are uh, they're Jains, they're strict vegetarians. And they, so this, this tends to pervade the community and has, uh, exerts a, a very salutary influence on the community. Uh, at large. Uh, uh, many of the Jain children become, uh, 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 aspire to become uh, Moonies. Uh, it's considered a great honor 
in the community to become a Muni. Uh, some of them convert as early as, uh, at, uh, as age 15 and younger. Uh, the Munis go out to the schools and they talk to the children. Uh, uh, many of them are, are very uh, eloquent speakers and are popular in the community. Uh, so the, the young uh, children, uh, especially uh, poor, among poorer Jains, uh, aspire to become Munis, and uh, it's a great honor in the family, uh, akin to, almost akin to what the rabbis used to be for the Jews. Uh, used to be considered the, the highest calling among Jews to be a rabbi. Of course, that's been displaced by uh, doctor, becoming a doctor or a lawyer. But it's in Jane, in the, among the Jains, it's still uh, considered uh, the highest calling. Uh, we got a lot of doctors and lawyers, too. That's true, yeah. Uh, and business people. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but it's still an honored, an honored calling. Uh, that, uh, uh, that brings me to the point of uh, the uh, paradox that many people find that the Jains uh, are the smallest uh, sect in India, and yet they are perhaps the wealthiest uh, group in, as well. They, uh, they have uh, amassed uh, more wealth per capita than any other group in, in, in India, perhaps in the world. Uh, people wonder why why this should be so. Well, they, the Jains claim that it's because they uh, have their religion forbids them to enter uh, certain professions such as uh, agriculture, uh, obviously the leather trades, the butcher trades, the, the restaurant trades, because they, these involve uh, killing life forms. Uh, so they have uh, studiously avoided taking part in any of these uh, professions. Uh, and they've been compelled to enter uh, such professions as law, science, banking, commerce, and, and the professorate, because these are harmless trades. Harmless. And, but they also happen to be the most uh, lucrative, so that may be one reason why they've uh, accumulated all this wealth. Uh, so generations of, uh, of Jains have, have sort of acquired this, this genius and, and gene for uh, excelling in, in commerce. Uh, and it's also considered, uh, they have a tradition of uh, where the Jain businessmen consider it an honor to, uh, confer, uh, to confer gifts on the, uh, on the church and to beautify uh, the temples uh, and to found new ones. So there is a tradition of, uh, of the Jain businessmen Making over many of his uh, profits to uh, to the chain uh, to the temples, and uh, that's why the, the, they have some of the most magnificent temples uh, in India. Uh, and uh, the Munis, many uh, many of them sleep uh, in the temples themselves on the top floor, which is not really a hardship because the even the smallest temples in uh, in India, the smallest Jain temples, are quite uh, are quite beautiful. I often have spectacular views, and uh, it's it's a pleasure to, to just to be uh, to visit them. I mean, you, you feel uh, that you uh, enter a sacred uh, precinct when you enter a, a Jain temple, and uh, it's customary among the Jains that if they uh, if uh, Jain visits uh, the temples, all of the major temples within one and within his lifetime, uh, they're scattered about the country the major temples, that, they, that he, his karma will, will be substantially re reduced, if not resolved altogether. So there is, a, the, ch the temple plays a, a, a very important role in Jain life. Uh, another uh, interesting uh, facet of Jainism is that the, the sadhus and the, sa the sadhwis, or the munis, as you might want, might want to call them, are, uh, are not really priests. Uh, they are they are considered uh, advanced uh, laymen uh, who have uh, achieved greater, uh, greater religious uh, insight and have progressed farther than the average layman. But they do not. There is not this great gulf between uh, the uh, the munis and the, uh, the laity as there is in Hinduism, for example. The priests, the Brahmins, uh, are a class apart. They hold themselves aloof and above. The, uh, the the common people who worship them, and uh, the the average Hindu cannot uh, 
cannot worship his own deities without uh, without having an intermediary, without going to a Brahmin, without having a Bra paying a Brahmin to conduct a sacrifice for him. Uh, whereas if one goes to a Jain temple, one can uh, you conduct your own uh, uh, puja yourself. You participate in your own puja. You are your own priest, so to speak. Uh, there is no uh, intermediary whom you have to pay to do it for you. Uh, if you want advice and counsel, then you go to, to a Jain Muni, and he will. Uh, they spend much of their day uh, studying and uh, uh, educating themselves and talking and exchanging uh, information and, and knowledge. And they are very, very uh, wise men, and they, and they are in a position to uh, to proffer advice, very good advice. Uh, so that is their function, really. They are counselors and not priests, uh, which is quite refreshing. Uh, the Brahmins can really be quite uh, annoying in their, their sort of mercenary attitude. If you go to a, a Brahmin, a, Jain, a Hindu temple, uh, many of them you have to pay to, to participate, which is quite uh, uh, revolting, I think. Uh, but if you go to a Jain temple, there is none of that. Uh, uh, yes? Yeah, um, don't they engage in some forms of commercial enterprise? Because a friend of mine came back from India, mm -hmm. and she brought me some gold, a uh, uh, silver leaf, yeah. which she bought from the Jains, she said. Yeah, I'm not saying the Jains don't do it. I'm saying the priests. Uh, I'm saying the, the monks. They're not really priests. They oh, I thought she got it from the temple, though. I guess I was mistaken. Uh, I really, uh, they don't engage in commerce. In fact, the, the, the Munis are not permitted to touch money. Uh, they're forbidden to touch money because money is considered a highly volatile uh, uh, medium. It's not considered intrinsically uh, uh, evil or corrupt as it is in Western tradition, uh, but it's considered volatile. It has the potential for, for, uh, for good and for evil, but they do not want the, uh, the Moonies to be exposed to the, to the volatility of money. And so they, if the Moonies need anything, uh, uh, you may wonder how they pay for their postage stamps or their uh, their newspapers or that sort of thing. Well, the, the members of the community uh, make themselves available. They go to the temple and they inquire as to the needs of the of the Moonies and if they should need anything at all, the uh, members of the community will provide it. They will go out if they need uh, a paper, if they need a book, writing material, whatever it may be, a Jane businessman will, will provide it. It is considered a it is a way of acquiring merit uh, to serve the Moonies. So uh, they, uh, I, I can't imagine that, uh, that anyone could purchase anything from them because they're not permitted to engage in the direct commerce at all. Yes? The Jainism is the war of our Western standards of philosophy or religion. Well, many uh, many of the so-called uh, Eastern religions could could also be uh, considered to be philosophies as well as religions. Uh, the deities uh, are called are the Chathankaras, actually, the Chathankaras, the great teachers uh, of uh, of the tradition. Uh, the Chathankaras, uh, the first Chathankara, they go back as far as the, the in the Jain traditions. The first Chathankara uh, arose in the at the beginning of the Neolithic. Age, which was uh, roughly about 8,000 BC. Of course, I mean that's uh, a way of uh, of extrapolating it. But of course, according to the Jains, there is no beginning to their religion. It's eternal. Yeah, there, it has no beginning and no end. Something that has no beginning and no end and is eternal is a circle. So uh, their their uh, religion, the ta time for the Jains is circular. It's a great wheel. It's the Kali Yuga. It's uh, uh, so uh, there's no no uh, beginning in that sense, uh, but the Trithankaras are what we might consider uh, deities. They, uh, when the Jains go to the temples, they uh, they uh, say prayers and benedictions to the Trithankaras. They anoint them. Uh, they treat them almost as a Westerner would a saint, shall we say, you know, at a Catholic church or something. Yes. Something that you know, he kind of says, well, you know, you're, it's not really like praying in the sense of like you know praying for something or asking. It's more like 
these people have attained a certain state, and whatever the qualities that they have, that's what I want to you know, embody myself. So it's like, I want to emulate this type of a thing. So it's, it's not like in a traditional sense of prayer. It's more like saying, well, you know, I'm thinking of these qualities, I'm thinking of this individual because he's attained this state, and therefore I would like to be like him, and therefore I need to, you know, try to attain that sort of state. Yes, no, it's not really a... Uh, you want to realize this quality is within yourself. Yeah. They want to become uh, like the Trithakuras, and if possible, they would like to become Trithakuras, uh, which are the highest, the highest form of uh, humanity, the highest form that one, one can achieve. Are there female Trithakuras? Trithakuras is pronounced, yeah. Are there female ones? Uh, there is one female Trithakura. I think the 20, is it the 19th Trithakura? The 19th Trithakura is a female. Depending on which <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> Who knows? There may have been more. I mean, uh, with a religion that is uh, that is timeless, there, uh, there there are bound to have been more. Uh, the uh, Albert Schweitzer, who was uh, instrumental, as I mentioned, in in discovering uh, the Jains to the West uh, in his writings, uh, uh, was a very devout uh, Catholic, and uh, he was born in Alsace Lorraine. Uh, as much as he admired the Jains, he criticized them for being uh, obsessed with, uh, with cleanliness and purity. Uh, he did not give them credit for being great humanitarians, uh, for being compassionate, because he felt that uh, they, uh, they are avoid being cruel to animals uh, more out of a, a fetish for purity and cleanliness than, for, out of, than from uh, considerations of uh, compassion. So. He, uh, he charged the, grain, the Jains with being uh, uh, obsess, obsessive about purity. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Schweitzer uh, had never traveled to India. He had never met a Jain. Uh, he, uh, he theorized about them in his study. Uh, of course, he's famous for his, uh, his great humanitarian uh, uh, achievements in, in Africa, but he did not travel to India. And uh, although he was in awe of the Jains, I think he was, uh, as he did not want to uh, want them to steal the thunder from the Catholic, from, from Christianity. Uh, he was first a Christian, and I don't think he wanted to, to grant that, uh, that boon, to, to concede that point to the Jains, that they may actually may have been greater humanitarians to them uh, than Christians. Uh, the, the Jains, uh, if anyone who has witnessed a, a Jane housewife, for example, preparing a meal, uh, will be struck by the way she, she picks through the, the rice and the grain, the doll, uh, making sure that there are no insects. If she should find an insect in the rice, for example, she will, she will carry it out to the garden and uh, set it down gently to make sure that it has another chance at life. Uh, I think if uh, Schweitzer had traveled to India and had witnessed the uh, uh, witness the, the pinjar poles, for example, the animal hospitals, the rest homes, uh, he would have had a, uh, a different view. Uh, if he had witnessed the, the Jane housewife uh, taking all these precautions, I don't think he would have arrived at the same conclusion. Uh, so uh, I think the Janes do deserve credit for, for, their, for their humanitarianism. Uh, yes? Uh, you mentioned that uh, a lot of Jains will not take certain set, uh, professions. Yes. People are, uh, and they're, therefore, they're limited. I'm wondering if the, the certain professions that you mentioned, such as commerce, law, etc., if there are certain variables, eth ethical variables in, in them, such as um, investments into a, a company that, that deals with brutality. I wonder if there's laws or, or oh, yeah, something yeah. that protects the Jains from investing. Yes, they were, you know, if they're orthodox, of course, it, it depends on the, on the individual Jain. I mean, each one has his own standard of values. There, In fact, well, there are Jains who are, you know, not as honest as the next, next person. There are certainly, one cannot uh, uh, make them appear to be uh, immaculate. I mean, they, they are, uh, there are some sharp, sharp businessmen who uh, cut corners and, uh, you know, who are uh, just as capable of being, uh, a flim-flam, you know, that sort of thing, as, as a Western businessman. 
but the great mass of them, I think, do try to, to, to be honest and adhere to the precepts of Mahavira, among which uh, honesty was one of the, uh, the prim primary precepts. Uh, and I think they would try to avoid get, uh, get uh, fraud or anything of that sort. Of thing. Yeah. Did you get into the uh, uh, the uh, concepts of avoiding of conflict uh, within the Jain philosophy? The, the avoiding avoidance of conflict. Well, I because we came in late. Uh, I understood that they avoid conflict at all costs, and in so doing, they don't criticize one another. So, uh, uh, well, I think that's a, a highly idealistic view. <laughs> that was explained to they, me that way. They do. Uh, they do criticize each other quite, quite openly, and uh, uh, they do. They are pacifistic, though, and. Uh, they will not serve in the military uh, under any circumstances, and uh, they uh, they are for the most pacifistic people in, in the world, probably. And uh, uh, they uh, they are, however, capable of protecting their their rights uh, and their their interests quite quite fiercely. Whether they would, uh, and they I suppose in, the, in their history they have taken up arms. For example, when they were persecuted by the Muslims. In the uh, during the Muslim invasions uh, uh, in the uh, 13th century, the 12th or 13th century, they were uh, they, they the Muslims uh, raised their their temples and destroyed their artifacts, and in the face of that kind of threat, they would naturally they were driven to uh, almost to extinction. The Muslims uh, stamped out the the Buddhists in, in India. They, they were and they would have done the same to the Jains. But the Jains uh, managed to resist them, and uh, they have uh, met, thrived. Uh, they, their, their population has remained stable. Uh, ironic, it's quite miraculous because they haven't really expanded, or, nor have they contracted. They've just they've stabilized and remained constant uh, throughout. Uh, and they've survived Muslim purges as well as uh, spasms of Hindu uh, Hindu nationalism. Which have been, which have driven them from one part of the country to the other, but they have managed to to uh, to survive. And in fact, they've had to make accommodations with Hinduism. The Hindus have sort of annexed them uh, as a caste uh, into the Vaisya. It's called the Vaisya caste. Uh, this is the the merchant caste. There are th I'm sure most of you know there are three castes. The principal castes are the the Brahmins, the priests, the Kshatriya the warriors, and the merchants, the Vaishya. Uh, the, as a way of accommodating themselves to Hinduism, the Jains have allowed themselves to be uh, annexed to the Vaishya caste, and they're considered Vaishyas, and they enjoy some protection from Hindus, and, and the sense is they're, they're counted as Hindus, and not as a separate population, even though they consider themselves to be separate uh, from, <coughs> from Hindus. And, uh, and uh, as a way of, just as a way of uh, surviving, they had to do this. Um, uh, Mahavira uh, is the, the last Trithankara, actually, uh, the 24th Trithankara. His parents uh, were worshippers of the previous Trithankara, Karshva, and uh, we know very little about the previous Trithankaras. Uh, we know most about Mahavira. And uh, he was born into a princely family uh, of Kshatriyas, uh, Kshatriyas, the warrior family, princely family, as was the Buddha. Uh, and uh, he was actually born into a very wealthy uh, family who enjoyed all the uh, purposes of their rank. They, they uh, uh, had a little kingdom of their own in uh, Vaishali, it's called. Uh, and he was raised uh, with every mark of of favor. Uh, when he was uh, 28, uh, his parents uh, uh, were uh, afflicted with a fatal illness, uh, and they committed uh, the only act of violence that Jainism condones, which is called uh, Salakana. Salakana. Uh, Uh, Salakana is a, is a form of suicide uh, in which uh, uh, the, uh, the Jain will, will fast to death. Uh, this is permitted only at the end of life and only if one has the purest of intentions. 
uh, it's not permitted. Uh, you can't just do it on a whim when you're in your 30s or in your teens. It has to be a, 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 in the final stage of life. And you must have the highest, uh, highest intent. Uh, you're wishing to, to perfect your life, or, uh, wishing to uh, improve your life. And uh, Mahavira's parents committed Salakana at the age of 28. Uh, Mahavira then was told by his older brother to, uh, to wait a year before uh, renouncing his, uh, his uh, princely uh, titles and prerogatives. So he waited a year, uh, mourned, mourned his parents, and then he, he traded in all his princely uh, trappings for the, for the pincha, the, that is the little wisp room. Uh, he, he, he stripped himself of his clothing. Uh, became a Digambara, and uh, he uh, received a bowl, a begging bowl, or an alms bowl, and then he joined the, uh, the sect of, that his parents had worshipped, the, uh, the followers of Parshva, Parshva, the previous Tirthankara. And then he, he wandered, uh, uh, he studied with the followers of Parshva, he wandered for 13 years, uh, much as Buddha did in the wilderness, and. Uh, Eventually, he achieved uh, he achieved uh, insight, uh, and uh, he was sitting under a salt tree, just as Buddha sat under a a fig tree, and uh, he achieved, he uh, achieved enlightenment at that time. Uh, and he made his uh, uh, after he achieved enlightenment, he 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 began to, uh, to preach, and uh, in the last years of his life, he attracted. Uh, 200,000 followers, uh, and uh, in order to become a member of his uh, his sect, one had to uh, had to take uh, vows. The first vow was of uh, uh, of being ascetic. Uh, uh, one must uh, uh, avoid uh, killing of all or uh, injuring of animals of all of all of all sorts and all forms. Uh, the uh, these are one of the five, the five vows, actually. The second vow, uh, one has to abstain from lying. Uh, the third vow was that well, an ascetic should not take what has not been given, which is very similar to the first vow, because if you uh, refrain from harming animals, you must not take what has not been given by taking their lives. Uh, it's also, it's a, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, operates to, uh, against uh, theft as well as against, uh, it's an injunction against taking life, the ultimate form of theft. Uh, and uh, also the fifth vow was, the, I'm sorry, the fourth vow was that the ascetic must renounce sex. Uh, all Jain sadhus and munis to this day are celibate. Uh, they believe that sex uh, is, uh, is an ungovernable passion and can, it's a waste of uh, seed which, after all, is a form of, uh, of life. Uh, uh, also, the fifth vow was that they must avoid attachment, a successive attachment to anything or anyone. Uh, and this is, this is uh, very much in practice uh, among the Munis today. If you, go, if you observe them, they, for example, they will not stay in one temple for, for more than a, a, few, a few weeks. They, they're always on the go because they, they do not want to be attached to any particular temple any particular person. Uh, <clears throat> so non-attachment. Uh, one also finds the same, same idea in Buddhism, which is another uh, correspondence. Uh, another, the sixth vow was that one would not eat after dark. Uh, the Jains, to this day, the Orthodox Jains will not consume their food after dark because the, the flickering light will attract insects Insects may fly into the food or into the gaping mouth of the of the eater, the diner, if he's not if he's not uh, alert. So this is why, especially in Mahavira's time, this is very important because uh, there were no screens or windows. Everyone was eating out of doors under candlelight, or so uh, insects would, would in inevitably be drawn to the food. Uh, so. Uh, these were the five great vows that he made his followers uh, adhere to. Um, also, he made them uh, promise that they, 
that after his death they would have no priest, that they would follow no priest, they would, that they would allow no intermediaries in the, just to come between them and their, their religion. And this has also been uh, perpetuated today. Uh, I mentioned the Amuni's function as, uh, as advanced laymen, as wise men who counsel the laity. They are not uh, priests uh, who set themselves above uh, the ordinary man. Uh, uh, Mahavira, uh, at the end of his life, uh, committed uh, Salakana as well. Uh, and he uh, fasted to death, and uh, when he died, he left uh, 200,000 followers. And uh, the, he uh, has not been succeeded. He was the last of the Trithankaras, the 24th Trithankara. Uh, the Jains on the world are still awaiting <coughs> the, uh, the, 20, the 25th Trithankara. He's not, he has not materialized. Uh, Pardon? It wouldn't be a 25th. Oh, what do you mean? Um, it would be another cycle. So uh, maybe it would be the first of a new cycle. First of a new cycle. First of a new cycle. It should be like, you know, the equivalent of thousands of years or maybe a million years. Or something. The first thing that, that Mahavira did when he became a, uh, a Muni was to uh, launch a vigorous uh, crusade against flesh eating and animal sacrifice. Uh, he and the Buddha were vigorous uh, opponents of the Brahmin. The Brahmins at this time who were at this. Uh, in his era, in the 6th century BC, they were sacrificing animals uh, in the temples, M much as they are today. If you go to Calcutta, you can, you can witness the, the Brahmin sacrificing goats to uh, Kali, the goddess Kali, and they, they sacrifice the goat and then they distribute the, the meat among the worshippers. Uh, so uh, this, was, this has now been restricted to, uh, to one little uh, branch of uh, Hinduism, but at the time, they were all doing it, all the priests were. Uh, as a result of the Aryan uh, influence, influences. Uh, so he was one of the, the great ref religious reformers and religious teachers of India, and it's, it's a pity that uh, the West, uh, that he remains such an obscure figure in the West, uh, and that Jainism, I hope, will come to be better known as the West becomes more enlightened on these matters.